what am I doing here at this satsang? Why did you come? Ask yourself. Did you come to observe the speaker? To compare him with other speakers? Or are you tired of playing games? And you want to get on with it? What is the real reason you came tonight? You had nowhere else to go? You saw all the movies? All the TV programs? Looking for a new face? Ask yourself. Your life is very short. What are you doing with it? Unless you awaken in this life, you will come back again and again and keep playing this game over and over again until the day comes when you awaken. The only freedom you've got is to turn within and not react to conditions. I usually do not talk about myself. But I received an interesting phone call today from a lady in Santa Cruz. She said, Robert, if you don't say something about yourself, nobody will know where you're coming from. They will think you got this information from a buck or from another teacher. They will not know it comes directly from the self. So I thought about this. And for a few minutes, I will discuss my life up to the age of 14 years old. That should bore you enough. I was born January the 21st in Manhattan, New York. from the very beginning, as far back as I can remember, when I was in my crib, a little man with a gray beard and white hair used to appear before me at the other end of the crib, about two feet long, two feet tall, and speak gibberish to me. I thought this was normal, and everybody had an experience. Of course, being a child, I didn't understand anything he said. It's only in the later years, when we started to read books, that I realized this person was Sri Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. But nevertheless, he appeared before me until I was about seven years old. Then it stopped. Then something very interesting happened to me. Whenever I wanted something, a candy bar, a toy, I would say God's name three or four times, and it would appear from some point. For instance, if I wanted a candy bar, I would say, God, God, God. 
somebody would bring it to me. Or it would come from someplace. When I went to school, I never used to study. When we had a test, I would say, God, God, God. And the answers would come. Once I wanted to play the violin, and my mother told me that would be too hard for me to play. So she wouldn't buy me one. So I said, God, God, God. And a few hours later, my uncle appeared, who I hadn't seen in about five years. He bought me a violin. He thought I needed a violin. And this went on now while I was going to school. When I was 14 years old, a strange phenomenon happened. I was in my junior high school class. There were about 35 children. The teacher's name was Mrs. Riley. She weighed about 300 pounds. And when she got angry, she used to jump up and down. So, of course, we used to make her angry. <laughs> so, there was a door, a bobby pin from a girl. And there was a hinge in the back of the seat. I would stick the bobby pin in the hinge and twang it. And she'd go crazy. She didn't know where the noise was coming from. And she'd jump up and down. Very interesting phenomenon. <laughs> anyway, it was the end of the term. We were taking our final test. This was a math test. I never studied for it, so I didn't know anything. So I said, God, God, God. Instead of the answers coming, the room became filled with light. A brilliant, bright light. A thousand times more brilliant than the sun. It was like an atomic bomb, the light from the bomb. But it was not a burning light. It was a beautiful, bright, shining, warm glow. Just thinking of it now, makes me stop and wonder. The whole room was immersed in light. Every part, every time. All of the children seemed to be myriads of light particles. And then I found myself melting so into radiant being into consciousness. I merge into consciousness. It was not an out of body experience. An out of body experience is when your body your soul leaves your body. This was completely different. I realized that I was not my body. What appeared to be my body was not real. And I went beyond the light into pure radiant consciousness. 
I became omnipresent. My individuality had merged into pure absolute bliss. I expanded. I became the universe. The feeling is indescribable. It was total bliss, total joy. The next thing I remember is the teacher shaking me. All the students had gone. I was the only one left in the class. The teacher was shaking me. And I returned to consciousness, human consciousness. That feeling has never left me. Now, what does this have to do with you? Everything. For when I say, you are absolute reality, absolute bliss, when I say that all this is the self, and I am that. I am encompasses everybody, everything. I am that encompasses the whole universe. I am that. Pure intelligence, ultimate reality, Satchitananda, Parabrahman, I am speaking from my experience. Death becomes a joke. There's no such thing. Your real nature is immortality. Your real nature is unalloyed happiness. Ultimate oneness. This is what you really are. Awaken to it and be free. How do you awaken? Well, in reality, you're already awake. But you're dreaming and you don't know it. It's like when you go to sleep and in that dream there's an earthquake. Everyone is dying all around you. And I come to you and I say, this is not real. You're having a dream, don't you know? And you tell me you're crazy, Robert. This is not a dream, this is real. Can't you see the earthquake? Can't you see people dying all around you? But I say, no, it's a dream. You refuse to believe me. 
and all of a sudden you wake up. You find yourself in this world. The only difference between this world and the dream world is this world is a little longer. That's a dream. The world is not real by itself. Ultimate reality. Pure intelligence. Emptiness. Space. That is reality. It is like a gigantic screen that takes up the entire universe. That screen is consciousness. And all the worlds, the planets, the suns, people are all images on the screen. If the screen weren't there, there could be no images. Therefore, you cannot say the images are real. They're only real as long as the screen persists. There's no place to show the images. In the same way, your true nature is consciousness, pure consciousness. Your body is superimposed on consciousness. You've made the mistake of identifying yourself with the body and mind. Therefore, the body and mind seems to control your life. But as soon as you switch identities, as soon as you begin to identify with consciousness, everything changes for you. You become happy, peaceful, joyous, blissful. It happens by itself. All you've got to do is to switch identities. Identify with reality. How do you do that? Every image that comes into your mind, you negate it. You realize that's not the truth. And you ask the question, to whom does this come? To me. You hold on to the me. You find the source of me. The source of me is none other than yourself. Once you make the identity and you awaken to yourself, all your problems are over. Think of the problems you think you have right now. Think. Who has a problem? Your real self can have a problem because that's plus consciousness. The problem comes to the ego. Only the ego has a problem, nothing else. Everything else is free, happy, no problems.
find out who you are. Discover yourself. Jump within yourself. Be yourself. Become free. Nothing exists as it appears. Nothing. Everything is consciousness. And everything is an image superimposed in consciousness. All of your thoughts, whatever is going through your mind, it has no basis, no cause. No ego. Everything you see is a projection of your own mind. You can put a stop to it by finding the source of your thoughts. Where do your thoughts come from? Find out. Go within. Ask yourself. You start in the morning when you first get out of bed. You watch your thoughts. Observe what you're thinking. Observe what you're doing. Whatever comes into your mind, ask yourself the question, to whom does it come? I think this. Follow the I thought to the source. Hold on to the I. and wait. Do nothing. Do absolutely nothing. Keep still. When another thought comes, use the same procedure. To whom does this come? To me? Who am I? Follow the I thought to the source. Do nothing. Remain in the sounds. Do not try to analyze anything. not try to come to any conclusion. If your mind becomes argumentative, ask yourself, who is argumentative? I am. Everything belongs to the I. The whole universe is attached to I. When you find the source of I, everything else disappears. Find the source of I and become free. Life is really simple. Why make it complicated? Why allow all your thoughts to control you, to control you, to control you. Why do you give in to your thoughts? If you want to become free, you have to stop thinking completely.
totally. When your thoughts come to you, no matter what they tell you, you have to ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? Who gave them birth? I did. Well, who am I? Do not allow your thoughts to be your master. What you call realization is only empty mind. When your mind is empty, everything happens by itself. Reality shines forth. <clears throat> when your mind is full of garbage, you become belligerent, arrogant, wild, and you have no peace. So observe yourself, watch your thoughts, see where they lead you, take control of them, and become free. I am not a lecturer, I do not give speeches, I do not give sermons, I'm only here and I'm available to you. So, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer if I can. <coughs> Feel free to discuss anything you like about spiritual life. The grand dissolution is also of your mind. Everything that happens, everything, is a projection and manifestation of your mind. When you realize that you are not a body-mind phenomenon, everything stops. The whole game stops, and you become free. For that person, there's no such thing as birth or death. Everything remains still and quiet. Everything stops. There's no dissolution. There's no desecration. <coughs> There's only peace. But you have to stop your mind from thinking. And the best and fastest way to do that is through Atma Vachara, self inquiry. That's the fastest way, as far as I know. You simply ask yourself the question, for whom is desolation? Who experiences these things? Find out. And you'll find that you are ultimately free. You've always been free. You have always been the self. From this form happy. That is your real nature. Even as I talk to you, look at the thoughts going through your mind. Look at all these thoughts that are going through your mind. Why do you allow them to control you? Why? It only hurts you, nobody else. Only the thinker suffers. Of course, it's difficult to stop thinking. 
but by asking the question, to whom do these thoughts come? Your mind begins to slow down and finally emerges in your heart. And then you're no longer controlled by mind. You're no longer controlled by anything. Your individuality will merge into the infinite and you will become free. How is it that uh, these little subtle thoughts have the power to obstruct? The they don't. Because your thoughts do not exist. How can they have power? Only what is real has power. And what is real is consciousness, absolute reality, total awareness. Thoughts have no power. They appear to have power. You have given them the power. You yourself have given your thoughts power by believing in them, by worshipping them, by doing what they command. Your thoughts tell you, go kill, you go kill. They say, go scream, you go scream. Go be belligerent, you go and become belligerent. You are controlled by your thoughts. But the wise person will stop and think and look within and ask to whom do these thoughts come where do they come from find out and you will realize they never existed to begin with it's all an optical illusion Just like the rope and the snake you've all heard about. You think a rope is a snake because it's dark and you can't see. But once you find out the truth that it's only a rope, you'll never be fooled again. You'll never be afraid again. So the thoughts are like the rope and the snake. They have no power. But you fear your thoughts. Therefore you give them power. Once you realize they're a non-entity, they're nothing, then you become yourself and you're free. The ego appears to practice and take the spiritual path. But there's something deeper than the ego. The self is pushing you from itself. <coughs> the ego tries to resist. The ego can be honor and destroy itself. Only when you destroy your ego do you use your ego to do that. That's the only purpose it serves. Otherwise, it controls you totally and completely. The ego and the mind are synonymous. The mind is only a conglomeration of thoughts about the past and worries about the future. That's all the mind is. The ego enhances the mind. They're both the same. The ego is like the light for the mind. But by self-inquiry, the light is extinguished, so the mind vanishes of its own accord, and you become free. Do not give your ego power by believing in it. Look at it like you do outside in the sky. When you say the sky is blue, 
everybody will agree with me that the sky is blue. But when you investigate, you find that there's no sky and there's no blue. It's just space. In the same instance, everyone believes there's an ego. But upon investigation, you will find out it never exists. It does not exist. Only the self exists, and you are that. So investigate, find out for yourself. I believe a word I say. Check it out, experiment, find out and see. When you speak of love and compassion, do normal people really have love and compassion? They only have love when somebody gives them something. If a person loves you, you say you love them. When they leave you for somebody else, you hate them. So the love and hate come. They're two sides of the same coin. But real love is beyond human love. Real love is the infinite. It cannot be described. It's consciousness. It's absolute reality. Real love is your real nature. And you can never really know how to love until you know who you are. If you really looked at your mind, and your mind really disappeared, there would be no need of the question, because you would feel ultimate peace. But what really happens to some of us is we think we're going beyond the mind. We believe we're looking at the mind. But something is wrong because we don't. Once we really observe the mind and realize it's no thing, we are already beyond it. We're free and happy. But sometimes, as I said, we think we're doing that and we're not. And you can tell. Once you catch a glimpse of self-realization, you'll never go back again. There's no turning back. You've either got it or you haven't. There are no steps to it. It's like when you're in the room of darkness and you find the light switch, the darkness just dissipates. There are no gradual steps. It doesn't become lighter and lighter and lighter. The light just goes on, the darkness dissipates. When your mind is really empty, realization comes of its own accord. thought, your mind is thoughts. As you observe the thoughts, they disappear, but more come. More come. And even when you're finished with them from this life, they'll come to you from a previous life. It never stops. So you have to keep asking the question, to whom do they come? To whom do they come? And keep observing and following the I thought and doing nothing. And one day they'll all be gone. And they'll be free. But you have to have patience and persistence. Remember, it took us so many years to be the way we are. Screwy, crazy, insane. So now it's going to take a little time, perhaps, to get over it. But don't worry about it, because we're all hell bound for heaven, whether we like it or not. Everybody gets the sooner or later. Our job is to be relaxed and calm, peaceful, to observe ourselves.
not the reactor conditions. Remember, every condition that comes upon you is karmic in nature. It's no accident. All you're doing is accruing more karma for yourself. And it will never end. You can just watch to observe the situation and not react. If you're driving home tonight and you have an accident and you hit somebody's car because they passed the red light, and even if it's their fault physically, in reality it's nobody's fault. If you react to it by becoming angry, belligerent, all you're doing is accruing more karma, and you'll have to go over that situation again and again and again and confront situations similar like that until you give it up and stop reacting. Then you win the battle. And you don't have to have a situation like that again in your life. Never if you're confronted and you do not react to it, then you finish with it. Whatever you do not react to is gone, it's finished. It's like when you have a friend and your friend is talking to you. You do not react to your friend, you do not answer or say anything. What happens? True? It's the same thing with a condition. If you do not react to a condition, the condition leaves you, it goes away, it never comes back. But for one who knows that he is not the player of the mind, there is no corrupt karma for that one. But for the onlooker, it appears to be so. For the ayani, there appears to be corrupt karma, not for the ayani. In other words, the ayani may see problems, and that's the karma coming to its conclusion. But for the ayani, there are no problems. You fall. What do you think? <laughs> Why do we worry so much? We're always concerned about something, aren't we? Why? The world has gone on without you for many years before you came. Millions of years. It will go on after you leave. So while your so-called existence in your body is here, why are you worried? Why do you fear? What are you afraid of? Be peaceful. Be still. Learn to love one another. Have compassion. Practice loving kindness. Be yourself. Always remember your real nature as absolute intelligence, as ultimate oneness, divine harmony, bliss consciousness, Satchitananda, Power Brahman. That's who you really are. Identify with that and be free. So what do you think of that? Not really. Consciousness is self-contained. Therefore, the ego 
It is not really part of consciousness. It is an optical illusion. It doesn't exist. It appears to exist. And it doesn't come from any place. It comes from your imaginings. But consciousness never gave it birth. It appears that way, but it's not true. Consciousness does not really identify with anything because of the self contained. Consciousness only knows consciousness. Everything else is an optical illusion, it just doesn't exist. Even if the appearance is strong, it does not exist. And you can always think about these examples. When you're in the desert and you're dying of thirst, you see a mirage, it's water, water, and you crawl to the water and what do you got sand? But the water appeared so real to you, didn't it? In the same instance, all the things of this world appear real. But they're like the optical illusion, they're like the mirage, like the sky is blue, like the sand that appears as water. It's false imagination, misidentification. Turn back, go within, dive deep within to yourself, identify with the self and become free forever. I think what some of us do is we read too many books and we make it too technical. And we think we have to do things. We have to do this and we have to do that. And we give everything names. We say consciousness is the light that shines the mind that becomes the ego. We don't have to know about these things. All we have to know is that I am not the body-mind phenomena. I am absolute reality. That's all you got to know. And follow the absolute reality. Become it. Do whatever you have to do to become it. Practice observation, mindfulness, watch your thoughts, vipassana, meditation, self-inquiry. Whatever you have to do, do it to quiet the mind. And then you will see something brand new. You will realize that you were never born, that you do not persist right now, and that you can never die. You are free. There is no stuff out of consciousness. There is no one? Stuff. Stuff? Yeah. Out of consciousness. No. Consciousness, again, is self-contained. Right. But there's nothing exists beyond consciousness. Nothing exists beyond consciousness. So we, thoughts, give, we give it names like pure awareness. Thoughts and mind in that respect. Mm. How to respond to that? How to stop them? No, I mean, if nothing exists beyond consciousness, thoughts as well as mind have to be within consciousness. It's part of it. Not really, because thoughts and mind do not exist. If they existed as an entity, they would be part of consciousness. Illusion, as per se. It's illusion. Illusion, by definition, is non-existent. Exactly. So they never really existed. Therefore, they cannot be part of consciousness. If they were part of consciousness, it would mean that they existed. And consciousness gave them birth. And now we have to try to get rid of them. But there's nothing to get rid of because it doesn't exist. You're finding nothing. So, illusion by definition would be something would be out of consciousness. It would be nothing. No thing. It never existed and never will exist. It's part of your false imagination. Where did it come from? It came from nowhere.
concentration doesn't exist. That's true. You're right. Consciousness doesn't exist either. The small concept. The finite can never know the infinite. There are no words to describe it. You have to dive within yourself and experience it for oneself to realize it. There are no definitions. Everything we say is a preconceived idea, concept. Go beyond that. And you go beyond that by stopping your thoughts. Stop thinking. That's how you go beyond it. And you stop thinking through self-inquiry and through observation, through awareness, watching, becoming the witness. Okay. So what's the point? The point is, um, if we do feel that, or um, if a lot of us feel that way, and still we have the duality of living our lives, especially when we're young, with strong desires, and then uh, as they fade, we still are imprisoned. This is why you have, to, you have to ask yourself, who is imprisoned? Who has these thoughts and feelings? To whom do they come? Go beyond everything you just said. Go beyond it. <coughs> Forget about what you just said. And simply go beyond it. Ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? About imprisonment? About being young, being old? About thoughts? None of that exists. Go beyond everything by asking the question, to whom do these thoughts come? To me? Or who am I? What is the source of the I? Follow the source and become free. Follow the source into the heart and do nothing but observe and watch. And you will find there is no source. It never happened. You've always been free. You've always been bright and shining. Everything else is nonsense. You mean it's just a memory? Of course. It's a memory, it's concepts, it's preconceived ideas. It's all those things. But don't think about those things. Forget about how you got there, how they came. 
realize who you are now. I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am not these thoughts. I am not this condition of the situation. Then who am I? Then stop and ask again. Then who am I? And as you keep asking like this, you will notice that the space between the who am I's becomes larger and larger. And in that space you will find your freedom. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything else will. Well, some people uh, were suggesting that we move the Thursday night meeting up a little bit or they don't get out of work by 4 o'clock. So that's kind of open for discussion. And also some people kind of felt that. Michelle? I did talk to If it's really gone, we'll stay gone. We'll come back. It makes no difference. Nothing will come up. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Don't think of time. Just do it. Oh. As a base. Why were you what were you doing that? If you were mm-hmm. free, why were you staying there? Just for the peace, just for nothing. No reason. No, it's very nice in there. It's very nice. Mm-hmm.
Who's uh, Sweet Ganesha? He's the editor of the Mountain Path magazine. Oh, yeah. So you're still affiliated with that ashram? I'm not affiliated with any ashram. He was there when Ramana was there. What's that? There's no, there's no particular way it happens. It's, it's, it's different with everybody. But that's the reality. The reality comes after all that stuff. After the light. After the experience. Reality is a void. Nothingness. Because they're still seekers. They have to stop being seekers and get down to business. <laughs> but who of who of these people that you're describing I have don't. not realized it? I don't think I've met anyone who hasn't realized something. Really? Yeah. I'm one. I'm one. <laughs> well, everybody's had little experiences, but my but something that has lasted, you know, not just little inner inner experiences. I have a problem with some of this. Uh, That's good. I mean, I don't really have a problem with it, but it's, it, uh, you know, it, there's, there's a question there. I, I don't even know that that's right. As it has a lot to do with semantics, mm. I feel.
I first I attribute it to something that this guy that I've been hanging around with did some kind of a you know, magic kind of thing. I later realized that all he did was set up a certain kind of a convenience for me to really look at the truth of uh, many things that I thought were true or kidded myself into believing it was true. And for about a week and a half, this this uh, ability to discern what was true was there, and there's no question in my mind about it, and there was no question in anyone else's mind about it. Uh, if I, like I said to my friend, I said, well, you're lying like a rug, and he gave me a very funny grin, <coughs> and he says, yeah, you're right, but how do you know? I said, I don't know. And I didn't know how I knew it. <coughs> Uh, but after a week and a half, uh, you know, going to work and the boss saying, uh, how are you, you know, and giving the appropriate response, fine, and uh, what do you think of this, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's wonderful, you know, when I really didn't think so. Next thing I knew, I was right back into the ball game again. Mm -hmm. um, I can understand all but I, what I have a problem with is this, this idea that this is illusory. And um, in a relative sense, I suppose it is. You know, I, I don't have it. But I can't see that the physical universe is an illusion. Okay, let's imagine you're having a dream. Yeah. And we're talking just like this in your dream. Uh -huh. And you point to the chair, you're feeling the chair, you say, I can't imagine that this is illusory. And you're telling me the same thing that you're telling me now, and then you wake up. You understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing. Yeah, I, it, it's, uh, as a matter of fact, my wife and I were having a discussion about this business of the dream, which is... Uh, it's also it served as it served as an example to express something, but um, I, I don't know. It, um, in a dream, I I, some, I perceive things. I start to put it more exactly. I see things. Obviously, I'm not using my body guy. In this, in this. Uh, situation I see things. I am using my body eye. The only thing I can conclude from those two things logically is that um, in each case I have a different modality of perception. Mm -hmm. In the in the dream, most of what I perceive can be attributed to or a lot of it can be attributed to creative imagination. But many things that I have dreamt, or so-called dreamt, to use the term dreamt, subsequently manifested in, in, in this reality. So they obviously weren't just uh, haphazard concoctions of something that was lying in my mind like a bunch of straws or, or things in a tinker toy that I put together. My perception of the dream world, or what we call dreams, it's a, it's a blank name that covers a multiplicity of things, which are not really totally understood. Okay. So what's the question? Well, the, the question is, the question is, I, I can't see how this duality, this duality can uh, be resolved. There, there seems to be duality everywhere. Here we are, we're, we're, we're sitting in a room, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's apparently very solid. It is to me. It cannot be resolved until you understand that you are not the body or mind. That 
I'm not what? The body or your mind. I, I'm aware of that, totally. If you're totally aware, it wouldn't be any problem. And you wouldn't ask the question. Well, it's not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem. It's not something that troubles me. It's just that I, I find it. See, so just by asking the question. Huh? Just by asking the question. It shows that you're not aware of it. If you were aware of what you're saying, there would be no question. Okay. That's your reality, not mine. In other words, the dream and the waking state are both projections of your mind. We can be talking right now. And you can have an awakening and wake up. And all this will be all gone. You'll see a completely different universe. When you actually dream, your mind projects the dream, and you have all kinds of experiences. They're both the same, there's no difference. Except this a little longer. That's all. When you dream, you think it's real. Well, of course. Well, you know, the city of Troy was buried for many, many years. And there came a time when it was just the, the whole idea of Troy was for just people didn't even know whether it was real, whether it was a myth or not. And then somebody got a shovel and started digging, and they, they found it. So the existence of something doesn't really depend on my recognition of it. Of course the, exi the existence of something for me depends upon my recognition of it. But the, the existence of it itself, through from, from right inference, doesn't appear to me to be dependent upon whether I recognize it, see it, or am aware of it at all. And as a matter of fact, the gentleman just said a while ago, don't worry about the world. The world has been around for a long time, long before you got here. Now that mm -hmm. connotes to me that, 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 it has, that even in this reality, that it has an existence, it has some kind of a, an existence. The only existence it has is the words that are spoken to try to explain. Uh -huh. That's as far as the existence goes. But we can be having a dream and discussing the same subject and talking about Troy and talking about what I just said before. It can all be in your dream, same thing. There's no difference. Okay. Yeah. The thing to do is to forget about that and ask yourself who's dreaming. Who what? Who's dreaming? Who's having this dream? Who's dreaming? Inquire with them and find out. Find out what's a dream and what's not. Ask yourself. If the answers are within you, I cannot give you the answer. It's within yourself. I don't want you to believe anything I say. Well, I, I obviously, you know, I'm obviously not doing that. I'm not disbelieving it. Good. Fine for yourself. But uh, I have to give some credence to the way I think, <coughs> whether the thinking is an illusion or not. You know. Who does? I can't dismiss. <coughs> who has? Who has to do all this? Why do you? Well, have to I do don't that? have. To Ask yourself who has to do this. And you'll find there's nobody to do anything. Okay. Well, I'll try that. I'll work. Really? Actually, when you ask, ask yourself a question, who, who doesn't have to do anything? It disappears. It does, you're right. Exactly. So when it disappears, what's that? What's that? Nothing. Only the self remains. And the self is emptiness. Void. And it's total joy and peace.
but you have to discover it by yourself.